Texas abortion case. A pro-life law goes back into effect. Critical comments. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi draws pushback after her meeting with the Pope. Ambassador to the Holy See. Former Senator Joe Donnelly gets nominated to represent the United States. And China tension. The communist country defends its treatment of Taiwan. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, October 11th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this feast of St. John the 23rd. I'm Tracy Sable. A federal appeals court temporarily reinstated enforcement of the Texas pro-life heartbeat law while it hears legal arguments over its constitutionality. Friday night's order stays a lower court ruling, which agreed with the Biden administration to suspend the law. The Supreme Court had already permitted the law to stand during appeal. The law's provisions prohibits an abortion after detection of a heartbeat. Its sanctions are civil, not criminal. The Department of Justice must respond by tomorrow afternoon. Well, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was in Rome over the weekend for a climate conference, but it is her meeting with Pope Francis that's generating a lot of talk. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has more. Although we don't know what House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Holy Father talked about during their meeting, the Vatican did put out this photo of Nancy Pelosi along with her husband and the Holy Father. Because Speaker Pelosi is known to be outspoken for her support of abortion, many Catholics are expressing their dismay. It's important to note popes often meet with heads of state and prominent politicians regardless of their views. Speaker Pelosi issued a statement about her visit saying in part, quote, His Holiness's leadership is a source of joy and hope for Catholics and for all people challenging each of us to be good stewards of God's creation. During the trip, the speaker attended mass at St. Patrick's Church, the American parish in Rome, but things didn't go as planned due to a security issue. And sadly, Speaker Pelosi and her husband had to leave. She was going to do our second reading today. In a previous interview with Archbishop Salvador Cola Leon of San Francisco, he told me Catholics need to have a greater knowledge of abortion's evils. We need to help jar the, the conscience of not just the, those who are aggressively pro-abortion, but of our country in general, to, so people can realize the gravity of this evil. The Archbishop is asking Catholics to pray the rosary for Speaker Pelosi and other politicians who are pro-abortion to change their hearts. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. President Joe Biden's nominee for ambassador to the Holy See, Joe Donnelly, is drawing strong criticism from the pro-life group Susan B. Anthony list. If he gets the job, the former senator from Indiana will be working for what the SBA list calls the most pro-abortion administration in U.S. history. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, President Joe Biden's pick is not exactly getting a warm reception from the Susan B. Anthony list. In fact, quite the opposite. They say Joe Donnelly does not represent the church's teaching on the sanctity of life. The Susan B. Anthony list says President Joe Biden's pick for ambassador to the Vatican, Joe Donnelly, fails to stand up for the unborn and for pro-lifers. He was at one time a very strong pro-life Democrat, but over the years waffled um, back and forth on the issues pertaining to life, which ultimately cost him his reelection to the Senate. In 2018, NARAL Pro-Choice America gave Donnelly an 80 percent rating. But the president of the University of Notre Dame supports Joe Donnelly, calling him an ideal choice to represent the United States at the Vatican. Going on to say he will bring to this role a deep understanding of the issues currently facing our nation and the world, a genuine Catholic faith, and an understanding of the role the church can play in our world. Mallory Quigley says the Vatican is going to have to grapple with this increase in American politicians who call themselves devout Catholics who really do not represent the church in the public square. Meanwhile, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops applauds the Biden administration's newly announced refugee cap, allowing up to 125,000 refugees into the country in the next year. The bishops say whether fleeing war, natural disaster, or persecution, the positive contributions of refugees to our society have been well documented. 
Now, a moment ago, you may have heard Marine One landing here at the White House. President Biden is back at the White House tonight, returning from Delaware. So far, his public schedule for the rest of the week has not been released, but rest assured, it will involve promoting his controversial and very expensive economic agenda. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Joining us now is Amber Athey, Washington editor of The Spectator. Amber, welcome back. Great to be with you. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi met with Pope Francis at the Vatican over the weekend. And today in Portugal, she received the Women for Peace and Security Award during a NATO ceremony. Uh, that said, she also received a, a bit of criticism from some going on her European trip because of all that's happening here at home. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Sure. I mean, I think a lot of conservative Catholics in the United States were um, very critical of her meeting with the Pope and um, a bit concerned about the fact that he would be willing to meet with her, given the fact that she is such an outspoken proponent of abortion. Um, the Pope has previously um, sort of criticized um, uh, religious leaders in the United States who have criticized um, churches who give communion to politicians who are openly in support of abortion saying that the issue should remain pastoral and not political. Um, but clearly here, we can't read too much into the meeting because we don't know what was said behind closed doors. It's perfectly possible that the Pope did talk to Pelosi about her stance on the issue. And without more details, it's uh, hard to be overly critical of the Pope choosing to meet with a politician, considering he does so quite often, regardless of the views that that specific politician holds. Yeah, I want to talk now um, about President Biden. His popularity appears to be plummeting now, even among Democrats. What do you think he can or maybe should do in order to gain back confidence? There are so many things. Um, first of all, securing the border. There's uh, undoubtedly a crisis when you have 15,000 Haitian migrants camping under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas, hoping to gain entry to the United States. Um, this most recent jobs report showed that the job growth of the United States was well below expectations, at least partially because the Biden administration has been encouraging people to stay home um, with these unemployment insurance payments instead of fully reopening the economy in the face of um, the waning pandemic. Um, and also, Joe Biden's behavior abroad has been particularly concerning for um, Americans who are worried about national security with the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan as well as his rather bumbling speech at the United Nations. So across the board, Joe Biden needs to be a stronger leader and be willing to put America's interests first, as opposed to trying to appeal to the progressive wing of his party. Yeah, and you mentioned the border. I was going to go there next. Uh, President Biden really getting low marks on his handling of the border crisis, which, as we know, seems to be getting worse. I know that you recently interviewed former President Donald Trump about a number of issues, including the border. Uh, what did he say about that? The former president uh, was very animated about the border issue and um, spoke specifically about the fact that the Biden administration, instead of dealing with its own policies and how they've led to a surge of illegal immigrants crossing the border, um, decided to throw Border Patrol under the bus and blame them for allegedly whipping um, Haitian migrants. As the former president pointed out, that was a bit of fake news. It turns out that the Border Patrol agents were simply riding on horseback and using their reins to control the horses. And it was a narrative that was taken out of context um, by people who did not understand um, that particular strategy in terms of border enforcement. Um, and he also talked about the fact that Biden undid a number of his policies, particularly the Remain in Mexico policy, that discouraged this type of um, uh, erroneous asylum seeking and other means of trying to enter the United States illegally. Yeah, I know another thing uh, that you also talked to President Trump about was the Department of Justice uh, directing the FBI to investigate threats of violence at local school board meetings, essentially to investigate parents. What did he have to say about that? Yes, the former president condemned the DOJ and Attorney General Merrick Garland for going after parents. He pointed out that most of these parents, in fact, the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of them, are engaging in peaceful but passionate protests against things like critical race theory, mask mandates, and vaccine mandates in their schools because they simply want a classical American-centric education for their children, not one that peddles in race baiting and other um, uh, leftist ideas. And um, when I asked him specifically about Merrick Garland and if he thought that the 20 Republicans who voted to confirm him to attorney general had made a mistake, 
He said that he still believes that Merrick Garland is a good man and that he can run the DOJ fairly and without politicization. Well, Amber, unfortunately, we have to leave it right there. Great to speak with you. Amber Athey, Washington editor of The Spectator. Thanks again. Thank you. China pressures Taiwan's independence after Australia's former prime minister sides with Taipei on trade. China condemns last week's visit by Tony Abbott as a violation of its sovereignty. Abbott met with President Tsai and supported Taiwan's Trans-Pacific Partnership membership in competition with Beijing. Separately, China is denying a whistleblower's charges that it has mistreated Uyghur Muslims. Coming up, coronavirus crisis. Questions surface about one of the vaccines. And protecting the planet. How a Catholic Foundation is getting involved. Countries around the world have purchased a total of about 3.5 billion doses of the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine, making it the world's leading shot. The Vatican has said that it is morally acceptable for Catholics to receive the Pfizer vaccine, but some concerns remain about its development. Joining us now for his analysis is Dr. Joseph Meany, president of the National Catholic Bioethics Center. Dr. Meany, welcome back. Always so good to see you. Um, as you may know, Project Veritas recently released an interview uh, with a whistleblower from Pfizer who shared what she says are internal company emails showing the company's hesitancy to share information about the role of fetal cell lines in vaccine development. What more do we know about this? And should Catholics who received the Pfizer vaccine be concerned? Right. So it, it goes directly to the fact that uh, Pfizer really wanted to focus the message, right? The mRNA vaccines are not produced in any cell lines and therefore not produced in the abortion drive cell lines. However, they did confirmatory testing using the HEC-293 line. So that's the, you know, human embryonic kidney. And they really didn't want that information to get out. And it seems like they were trying to hide the fact because they realized that pro-lifers could have ethical concerns. And that is unfortunate because it, it means the company was essentially trying to, to pull a fast one. Yeah, and speaking of the Pfizer vaccine, um, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but that clip has been circulating on social media from an interview that you did with EWTN's Catherine Hadro regarding the Pfizer vaccine and how it was developed. Now, I understand that interview took place before the vaccines were even available. What did we know back then about the development of the vaccines, in particular the Pfizer vaccine, compared to now? And what has changed? That's right. So that was a November 2020 uh, interview. And essentially, the question was, you know, our abortion drive cell lines, was the Pfizer vaccine connected to abortion through abortion drive cell lines in its production? And of course, it's not. And so that's absolutely true. However, uh, the information did come out afterwards that there was confirmatory testing using the HEC-293 line. And so at the NCBC, we've, of course, mentioned that because people need to know it as they're making their discernment as to what to do. Yeah, and I'm glad we clarified that because some people may have been confused by that. Um, also, you know, using aborted babies for research really is a big factor behind vaccine hesitancy for a lot of people, in particular Catholics. Uh, do you think the concern of the public may push pharmaceutical companies to pursue more pro-life research in the future? So, I mean, the fact that the Pfizer executives seem to be concerned about the fact that the news could get out uh, means that they have some awareness that there is a, you know, a growing number of people who are becoming aware of the abortion drive cell lines and their use in research, but also that this is objectionable and that they're going to go to other vaccines or, or other products that don't have that link. Yeah, and before I let you go, um, I know that you are protesting the University of Pittsburgh's federally funded aborted tissue bank. Um, it's something that we have discussed before here on EWTN News Nightly. But for those who may not know about it, can you tell us a little bit more about what the university there is doing and why this research in particular has caught your attention? Yeah, so the University of Pittsburgh is wanting to become a leader in the nation, to be a hub, if you will, for the research on aborted fetal remains, on the on the organs and on the tissues. And, you know, there's some horrific images out there of rodents with human hair growing on their backs, uh, but that, you know, children who were aborted and scalped, and then that skin was grafted onto the backs of rodents. That's the kind of research that is being done at the University of Pittsburgh, and that they're getting federal tax dollars to support this research is horrific. And, and of course, it doesn't cause any cures. It's, it's, it's not really good science. But even if it were, I mean, it's completely unethical. And yet, it's being allowed to take place, and particularly, unfortunately, under the new administration.
Yeah, and it, it's really hard to hear about, but it's so important for us to talk about what is happening. And we thank you so much, Dr. Meany, for joining us. Thank you. A foundation run by Jesuit priests in Italy was one of the groups involved in a summit for young people last month. The Magis Foundation took part in the Youth for Climate event. The online initiative involved young people from around the world and included several discussions on preserving and protecting the planet. Joining us now from Rome is Stefano Liberti from the advocacy group of the Magis Foundation. Stefano, thank you so much for your time today. Um, can you tell us more uh, about the Youth for Climate project and how did the event go? Yeah, good afternoon. We made a, um, for this project, we made a survey among the students from the um, Jesuit schools in across Europe, in Italy, Germany, UK. Spain, Albania, and we asked them uh, about their concerns on climate, on pollution, on environmental in general. And the quite uh, uh, interesting thing is that we mm, made this survey with very young people. Those, those, those girls and boys are um, between 14 and 18 years old. And they are very much concerned about the future and also about the present. They had 96 percent of the people said uh, we, the main uh, concern for the future is the environmental crisis, the climate crisis, and they have the impression that the situation now is worsening year by year. So this is one thing. And the second thing is that we got an answer for, from a very huge amount of these uh, uh, students. We sent 7,000 um, surveys, and we got 2,000 answers, 25 percent. And this massive answer uh, tells us that this is a very important issue. And before I let you go, um, can you tell us about some of the other projects uh, that the Magis Foundation is working on right now? We, as the Magis Foundation, we have different projects across the world, especially in the southern world, in India, in Brazil, in Africa. One of the main projects that we are uh, implementing now is about gold. So we are working with gold miners in Congo DRC, in the Republic Democratic of Congo, and trying to help them uh, work in better condition. As you probably know, the, 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 those miners are working in horrible conditions, so we are providing them with uh, tools, with legal assistance in order to um, have better conditions, and then to export directly the gold they find in these mines to Italy. That is a project that has started in, uh, at the beginning of this year and will continue for the next few years. Well, Stefano, thank you so much for your time today and speaking with us. We appreciate it. Stefano Liberti from the Abbasi Group of the Magis Foundation. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good day. Up next, Pope Francis lists three ways for the faithful to reinvigorate their love for Christ. And a museum in the nation's capital takes a closer look at the Shroud of Turin. Pope Francis has advice for those who say they have grown tired in their faith and are looking for ways to reinvigorate their love of Christ. Faccio qualcosa per ottenere quel che mi serve. At his weekly Sunday address at the Vatican, the Holy Father says that there are three ways to overcome spiritual fatigue. Pope Francis suggests going to confession, attending Eucharistic adoration, and just sitting quietly and letting yourself feel God's love. Our scholars gathered this weekend at the Museum of the Bible in Washington to discuss the Shroud of Turin held by the faithful to be the burial cloth of Christ. Starting next year, the museum will hold an exhibit called Mystery and Faith, the Shroud of Turin. It will examine how science is affirming the miraculous nature of the image imprinted on the cloth. The exhibit will run from February until July 2022. And joining us now to discuss the mystery of the Shroud of Turin is Cheryl White, professor of history at Louisiana State University at Shreveport and co-host of the podcast, who is the man of the shroud? Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. 
Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, this is a really exciting exhibit that's on tap. That said, why is the Museum of the Bible studying the Shroud of Turin now? You know, because it is, it really is a mirror of the Gospels. And so for, um, for the Museum of the Bible, a museum that is, of course, dedicated to studying the impact and cultures uh, of the Bible, what better living artifact do we have today than that 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth that, that is a mirror of the Gospels? It tells us everything about the Passion narrative. And, and I know that you've called the Shroud, quote, the single most studied artifact in all of history. Why do you think that is? It is interesting that, that um, we have many objects and artifacts in the world that many academic disciplines have been brought to bear on. And, um, and we, we have usually reached an exhaustive point with, with that study. The Shroud is actually sort of a philosophical challenge in that it, it violates that general rule. It seems the more academic scrutiny we bring to bear on it from many different perspectives, then the more questions we are left with. So it, it, when I say it's a philosophical challenge, what I mean is we'll answer a question and then immediately be confronted with a new question. Yeah, and, and so, it really has baffled it, sci a scientist for centuries, for sure. It certainly has. And certainly since the, the, uh, the first photograph that was made in 1898 revealed the complexity of the image, when we realize that what, what the naked eye sees is a photographic negative, it's the photographic negative that is the positive image of the man in the shroud. So there is this, this absolute uh, inverse of the way the technology of photography works. Once we found that out and, and, and realized that nothing else photographs quite that way, um, that really launched the age of, of shroud science. The 20th and 21st centuries have just been uh, on fire with the study of this cloth. And, and we're at a point now, 42 years out from the Shroud of Turin Research Project from 1978, where we're still learning from that, from that great scientific endeavor. But so much more we realized we could know uh, that, that we don't yet. Yeah, it really is amazing. I know that you've said that it is authentically uh, the image of Christ, and you've been studying the Shroud of Turin for about 30 years now. What is it about it that really fascinates you? And also, I'm curious, in what ways has it affirmed your Catholic faith? Well, you know, it is, um, it, it is, cannot really be any other person of history, uh, I think is the way I would say that. The man in the Shroud is uh, is clearly someone who has been scourged and crucified in Roman fashion, uh, someone who was crowned with thorns, pierced in the right side between the fifth and sixth ribs. And so to that extent, I would say that, that there is no other person in history that matches these unique wounds. Uh, I realized in 1988, when the carbon-14 dating results were published, uh, that we now, of course, are questioning uh, that the veracity of those. I realized then that my faith didn't hinge upon a relic. It didn't hinge upon the authenticity of this cloth. But I believe that the message of the cloth is, is what we as, as universally should be focusing on is who is that man? Who do you say that I am? Might be a way to, to pose the question. And to just be allow ourselves to be drawn into the mystery of, of what that cloth tells us about the suffering, the wounds, and, and, and who this person is that is represented there. Uh, and that, I think, is the focus of this new exhibit at the Museum of the Bible, is to pull people into that mystery. No matter what you think the cloth is, you will leave changed. Well, Cheryl, we are excited to see it, and thank you so much for coming on and speaking with us. We appreciate it. Cheryl White, professor of history at Louisiana State University at Shreveport and co-host of the podcast, Who is the Man of the Shroud? Thank you again. Thank you. And finally tonight, Peruvians in Lima joyfully participated in a blessing of their pets yesterday at the Church of St. Francis of Assisi. While the pets were blessed with holy water during the special service and some of the pets, while well, they wore their best outfits, this year's ceremony was festively celebrated after last year's cancellation due to to coronavirus. Look at them, so cute. And we thank you for watching tonight for the entire EWTN News Nightly team. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.